great to be here, Mark. Thank you for a very kind, uh, kind introduction. And knowing Mark for 26 years, I figured I'd be in for some, some razzing. So it's nice to get a reasonably straight introduction. It, it is awesome to be here. I, I love being at events like this. It's an opportunity to, to celebrate entrepreneurship and really uh, try to get people to take their ideas and turn them into startups and companies that are already existing take those startups and accelerate their growth, what we call speed ups, because that really is the future of, of our country. And I'll talk a little bit about that in this initiative I'm involved in now called uh, Startup America. But let me start at my beginning, uh, which is, as uh, Mark said, for me was actually about 30 years ago. When I first got interested in the internet and, and uh, what became AOL, I was in college. And I also point out that, you know, as Mark said, Mark Zuckerberg was in college, Bill Gates was in college when they got started. Both of them, I, I don't want to encourage you to take that path, because they both dropped out of college to pursue their ideas. It's generally better to kind of finish. But of course, another college uh, uh, entrepreneur who just you know, was doing things while at college and thought there was a better way is, is uh, Kevin Plank. And he's playing on the football team here, as I'm sure you know the story. And just said, you know, this shirt kind of, kind of sticky, kind of sweaty. There's got to be a better way. And now uh, Under Armour, of course, is one of the great uh, brands uh, in the world, and it's a great success story in, in this region. So you know, the ideas that you are incubating right now, talking about working on, and I'm sure most of you are working on different things, uh, they can be great companies. You shouldn't just think of this as a, sort of a, a passing kind of a fad that you're just involved in some project. How do you really turn this into a scalable company? Going back to my story again, when I got started, uh, the internet didn't exist. It actually was, uh, I graduated from college in 1980. It wasn't until 1992 that it was, the internet was commercialized. You can actually connect businesses to the internet. So when I was graduating, there was no easy way to connect into this. So I worked for some other big companies for a little while, Procter & Gamble and PepsiCo. But all the while, I was fascinated with this idea of interactivity. I had read a book at college by Alvin Toffler called The Third Wave, and he was talking about electronic cottages and electronic newspapers and home banking, and I just, even though he was a futurist and people were thinking of this as science fiction, I was reading this completely riveted and just knowing it was the next big thing. So the question for me was not really what that big idea was. I knew that was a big idea. It was how to get into that you know, business uh, when it didn't really exist yet. So I did uh, learn some things in some big companies. I moved to this area, uh, Tyson's Port of Virginia, in 1983 to join an uh, interesting company. It was one of my early lessons about entrepreneurship, which is there's a lot of ups and downs. And you really do need perseverance to kind of stick through it. Uh, it came up with this product called GameLine. Back in 1983, nobody had personal computers at home. But a lot of people had Atari video game machines. So the idea was essentially plug this in cartridge into your Atari game machine, connect to the phone line, and essentially turn it into a terminal where you could download video games, but also over time download email or stock quotes or you know, other kinds of things. So it was a way to start in, into this business, which I thought was a fabulous idea. Uh, so I moved here to join that company. Uh, and six months later, the company was teetering on bankruptcy. You know, the product just wasn't quite ready for prime time. The Atari market kind of imploded. I remember going to my first board meeting. I must have been like, I don't know, I was 24, something like that, 25 maybe. Uh, and the, the lead investor, Frank Coffield, who founded a firm called Kleiner Perkins, Coffield Buyer, still one of the great venture firms in the, in the world, looked at the sales statistics and said, you would have thought they shoplifted more than that. <laughs> and that pretty much was the end of that company. But thankfully, I stuck with it. And I and two other folks, Jim Kimsey and Mark Seraf, ended up starting two years later in 1985 what became uh, AOL. And we started with a small group, just a couple of dozen people. But we had this big idea. And initially, we didn't have much money. We had very little uh, venture capital. We were competing with big giants like IBM and Sears that committed a billion dollars to something called Prodigy. So we knew we had to come up with a, a different path. And we did partnerships with different companies, Apple and, and Tandy and IBM and so forth, to create custom services for them. That's really how we got started for the first five years. And then kind of broke through with, with AOL as, as the, you moved into the you know, mid-90s in particular. But again, this lesson of patience and perseverance was very important. Because even though I had this idea in 1980, and I joined this company unsuccessfully in 1983, and then started AOL, and uh, co-founded AOL in 1985, when we went public in 1992, we were the first internet company to go public. So I was on the road talking about what this internet is, and this, this computer thing, and this modem, and you know, you access these things and people are looking at me like I was completely insane. In fairness to them, we'd been at it for seven years and we had 187,000 subscribers, which isn't a lot for, you know, seven years of work. Thankfully, seven years later, it had gone from 187,000 subscribers 
to 20 million subscribers, and you know, from something like 30 million of revenue went public to 7 or 8 billion of revenue, and from market value when we went public, which was 70 million dollars, to a market value well in excess of 100 billion dollars. So it finally took off, but it really was a decade in the making overnight success. And I think that's one of the key lessons. If you're trying to attack a big problem, you have a big idea, a change the world kind of idea, rarely do they happen overnight. It takes you know, kind of that perseverance to see it through lots of ups and downs. What I've been focused on the last seven or eight years are trying to find companies like that, like a Zipcar that we're the largest investor in. You know, I'm sure some of you are familiar with that, the idea of car sharing. We got involved five years ago with still a little idea. It's grown nicely. It's actually companies in the process of going public. But still, it hasn't scratched the surface, I don't think, in terms of the, uh, the potential of a living social a, a commerce company we're involved in is doing the, the daily deal business. How do you create these big businesses uh, that have a potential to be big businesses, but recognize they generally start small and it takes a while? Zipcar, just going public now, as I said, has also been at it for a decade and only beginning to, to hit their stride. So that's one of the key things, that the, the passion you bring to bear, the people you assemble, and the perseverance you bring to bear really is critical to, to build these companies. Well, that's sort of my story. Now I want to talk a little bit before I open up for questions and we get to the main event, which are the, the entrepreneurs, about uh, Startup America and why it's so important. The White House asked me to uh, help head up this effort uh, just a little over a month ago, uh, and it's really all about celebrating and accelerating entrepreneurship. If you look at the statistics of the last 30 years, and the Kauffman Foundation does great research in this area, all of the net jobs created in this country, all of them have come from these high growth companies that are in what we call the speed ups. If you, if you tier it, the big companies, the Fortune 500, are basically flat for a whole variety of reasons. You know, buying businesses, selling businesses, some growing, some contracting, moving you know, jobs into other, other regions as they uh, push for productivity, a whole slew of reasons. But as a sector, it's basically flat. Some got bigger, some got smaller, but big business essentially has the same number of jobs. Small business, so, you know, real small businesses, the, the one restaurant, the one dry cleaner, that kind of thing, the, sort of the main street businesses also are essentially flat. Restaurants come and go, but, but the net employment in those sectors generally stays about flat. All the growth, and it's 40 million jobs over the last 25 years, that are in these companies that are called high growth uh, companies or speed ups. And that's really what the, the focus is. How do you take these ideas that have the potential to get to scale and give them more resource uh, build up the entrepreneurial ecosystems in different regions around the country, as, as we're obviously trying to do here in the Maryland, uh, D.C., uh, Virginia uh, region. So more of these entrepreneurs with more of these ideas have the potential to get the resources, not just the capital. Often it's the, the mentoring, the ability to connect the, into some, somebody who could be a potential partner or help uh, attract uh, uh, a talent. There's a whole variety of resources that need to be brought to bear. I understand there was an event that, you know, in the last couple of hours where 30 different organizations came to talk about different resources. That's critically important in terms of really building up uh, these, uh, these speed ups and, and bringing them to scale. So it's very important as the country focuses on job creation, which is important with a 9% unemployment rate. Went up, you know, went down a little bit uh, this week, but still uh, way, way, way too high. And more importantly, a global world that is, is much more competitive. We've seen this phenomenon of the rise of other countries. We need to step up our game in this country to make sure we really are the uh, leader in many of these sectors. All of that comes down to entrepreneurs. They're willing to take risks and willing to create the companies and scale the companies that really create the products and services that satisfy people's needs, not just in this country, around the world, which preserves our competitiveness and our economy and also creates the jobs. So this really is the main event uh, for our nation, and that's why I was happy to you know, play this role of, 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 of chairing the Startup America uh, a partnership. Now let me end on one note around this region, uh, which is when, when Mark was talking, I was reminded when I first moved to this area, as I mentioned in 1983, it wasn't much of an entrepreneurial region. It was really more dominated by government contractors lobbyists, others that were serving uh, the government. And there's always going to be that aspect to it. But the only other company that I remember that was sort of entrepreneurial in the same uh, spirit that uh, uh, AOL was in the 80s when we were getting going was MCI, a telecommunications company. But it was kind of lonely out there, to be honest. Even when we, we needed specialized ex expertise on uh, legal issues related to startup firms, we got that mostly from a firm in Boston. When we needed venture capital, we got that mostly from firms in New York and California, actually another firm in, uh, in Chicago. We really didn't have that entrepreneurial ecosystem in this, in this region. And it's been great to see it develop over the past uh, 25 years. Now that this broadly defined this region, I think is now ninth 
uh, in the country in terms of venture capital flows. Clearly, it's dominated still by Silicon Valley and to some, some extent, lesser extent, but still very strong, the whole Boston Route 120 area. But there's another 15 regions around the country that are really showing signs of, of, of life and, and vibrancy. And, and our region now is sort of on the same rough level in terms of venture capital as Denver and Seattle and, and cities like that. But there's a great opportunity because of all the things that are happening here, including you know, great schools like this one, uh, to take that up to the, the next level. So I really think it's important that you know, schools like this celebrate entrepreneurship, to have centers like this, to bring resources together, to have events like this with, with people like uh, Kevin uh, getting involved, to really shine a spotlight on these ideas and really encourage people, almost create a culture of entrepreneurship because it's not just about starting a business for the reason I mentioned. It really is about ensuring our nation has a great future as the innovators. And if you look at our history as a nation, starting with our founding fathers, they were basically entrepreneurs. They were willing to get on boats and sail across the ocean because they had an idea. They had a passion about that particular idea. And the whole growth and success of our nation over the last uh, couple hundred years has been similar kind of phenomenal. The whole industrial revolution, people like, you know, Thomas Edison basically was an inventor and also an entrepreneur. He created General Electric. Or Henry Ford that really got the whole concept of cars into the, into the mass market. Or more recently, folks like uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs have done that on the, the technology <coughs> side. These aren't just businesses. These are the, really the, the, the engines of growth for our economy and the source of pride and differentiation and, and resources for, for our nation. So what you're doing as entrepreneurs isn't merely about providing that product to somebody and creating you know, some jobs and making some money to support your family and maybe take some of the money you make and support you know, organizations in your community. That's all important. But the collective efforts of all of us as entrepreneurs really is what makes, has made this nation great and will continue to make this nation great. So that's why this is so important. And you should really think about your initiative, whatever you're working on is you're part of that tapestry of energy around entrepreneurship that really is going to assure our next couple of hundred years of, of, of a, as a nation are going to be as successful as the first couple of hundred years. With that, I'm going to stop. And Mark, you said there are a couple of questions that came in. I can't remember they came in from said Facebook or Twitter or something like that. So I have to be respectful <laughs> of my technology. I will read them and you can answer to the audience. Uh, these two, we have two questions were submitted by the audience. First is from David Botwick Reese, a current UMD senior, and he asks, Steve, what did it feel like to be on the cusp of something momentous right before you knew it was going to happen? Well, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated question because as I mentioned, at one level, I knew it was going to happen 30 years ago when I was you know, reading this book in college. I knew it was going to happen. At the same time, I didn't know exactly when or how it was going to happen or that I frankly was going to play any role in helping to make it happen. But I, I, I knew it was an idea that someday, somehow, was going to become something that was going to be a pervasive part of our society. Then, as I mentioned, I you know, stumbled around for basically a decade trying to figure out what the right way is to enter, enter the market and figure out the right business model and the right product. And there were a lot of barriers that we had to kind of work on in terms of getting you know, network costs down. Initially, it was $5 an hour that we were paying to the telephone companies to be able to provide our service. So not surprisingly, people were only using the service like an hour a week, you know, or, or AOL and, and, and more broadly the internet. But it's, at the time we launched, it was much too hard to use. So only technologically sophisticated people could use them. We had to, to simplify them. As I mentioned, the, the whole notion of modems and, and PCs, we had to get modems built in the PC so they're an essential part of the computer, not a peripheral part of the computer. There are a bunch of things we had to whack away at. And finally, in the mid-90s, things took off. So when it finally was clear that it really, this idea was coming to scale and what the dream we'd had for so many years, not just us, but so many other companies, uh, was now actually happening, was obviously tremendously gratifying. But it was not an overnight success. It was, a, it was a really a, you know, at least a decade in the making. Our second and final question comes from Fletcher Bowman from Rose Financial Services of here today. And his question is, with the advent growth and success of Facebook, Groupon, and Living Social, are we on the cusp of the next play, the next net boom? Well, to some extent. The, the, the success of, of, of Facebook uh, and, and many other firms, it, it's clearly the, 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 the traction they got so quickly, I think, is a sign that as, a, as an industry, as a medium, things have really arrived. I remember, it reminds me of that dinner with Mark uh, Zuckerberg 
I guess a couple years ago, and I was sitting talking to him, and I realized he wasn't even born when I started. And the little, little like, whoa, I guess I am getting old. The <laughs> grandfather of the internet. And he even told me, as, you know, he, he got his first uh, experience uh, programming was trying to hack into the AOL instant messaging system. <laughs> I guess he felt he had to come clean on that and get it off his chest. But he's had a tremendous success, and it really has become a global phenomenon. Over half a billion people uh, using it now. Groupon and Living Social on the social commerce side have seen a lot of traction. Twitter also has become you know, quite a, a phenomenon. And it's particularly gratifying for me and the other folks that were involved, in, including Mark and AOL in the, in the early years, because we always believed the killer app, the magic of this medium, was going to be community. You know, people talking to other people. That was the core, that was the soul of this medium. Course commerce was important. The course content was important. Uh, course connectivity was important. There are a variety of things that were important, but the, the real secret sauce we always believed was community, which is why we created instant messaging over 25 years ago and launched chat rooms and message boards and anything we could do to get people together, either people who already knew each other as a better way to stay connected, or people who didn't yet know each other but might want to know each other based on shared interest. That was the whole focus that we had. So the fact that these companies like uh, uh, Facebook and others now are such a part of everyday life, I'm sure you know, most people in the audience you know, we probably don't go a day without checking you know, Facebook. Some might not go an hour. Uh, it really demonstrates how pervasive this phenomenon has become. And that aspect we always knew was, was really uh, special. So with that, I should I end it because the most important part is coming. We've got some other speeches, but then we get on with the entrepreneurs, and that's why I'm here, to celebrate their work and all of your work. It's great to be here. Thank you for what you're doing. Together, we can create a great world.